Good afternoon. Welcome to the fourth international webinar of 2022 organized by Vets and Clean Vet Advance. My name is Alba Martos. I'm the international vet in Affinity Pet Care. And today I'm very happy to be here with Jordi Puig. Good afternoon, Jordi. Good afternoon. Uh, he's an European and American graduate in internal medicine, and nowadays he's working as a co-responsible in the ARS uh, Anicura Vet Hospital in Barcelona. In this session, we will talk about uh, feline triaditis. So, uh, well, Jordi is an expert of uh, his area, so I encourage you to to ask him everything you want. So you can do it in the YouTube channel. You can see in in the screen. And also remember that clicking on the link, you can see download. You can you can you can download and have the presentation for this session. So I will not delay any longer, and we will start. Uh, so, first of all, Jordi, why do you think that it's important to talk about this disease in cats? Well, I think that uh, I think it's a really interesting disease, and I think there's a lot of controversy in this um, in this pathology. There are many things that we still don't know, and however, there are new studies that have been showing new ideas and uh, show a little bit of more light regarding some uh, etiologies or causes or even treatment options that we have uh, for this cat. So I thought that was a good opportunity to show what is uh, the new things uh, that's happening in this disease. And I think that hopefully will be of interest of everyone. Okay, so I think that maybe it's a good idea to start with the basis. Uh, so maybe we can see uh, in this first part of the presentation, uh, what is feline triaditis? Yeah, I think it's important uh, to start with this question because I think that's important to understand uh, exactly what we're talking about. Uh, Philanthroiditis is a term that implies uh, the concurrent inflammation of small intestines, pancreas, a patibulary system. The first case was reported back to the 75 uh, at the University of Bristol and was published as a single case at Journal of Small Animal Practice despite the only a description from the pathology report was inflammation of the uh, pancreas and biliary tract, the author suggested that maybe there was an ascending infection of the biliary and pancreatic ducts from the duodenum, therefore opening to this new term of triaditis so that, that something was going on uh, between those three organs. Uh, you can see in this picture from the study, uh, you can see, for example, that uh, the, the nodules uh, in the pancreas, you can see also the gallbladder uh, was open and showed the thickened wall, and also that the biliary uh, duct was dilated and tortuous. Of course, there have been lots of studies since there. I think that one of the most important one is, uh, this one was published in 96 with uh, lots of cats with uh, uh, this combination of disease. But it's also it's something important that I want to mention, and we're gonna talk about that later on, that many of those cats also have an involvement of the kidney uh, presented as nephritis. Therefore, we have to talk about a multi-organ uh, disease rather sometimes that only the conquering uh, inflammation of three organs. Sometimes can be more than that. I think it's important also to understand the prevalence of this disease. Uh, however, we have some um, something that we have to discuss that uh, mo unfortunately most of the studies they have a retrospective uh, nature because they are based on necropsy studies, so there are lots of limitations when we read these papers. Also, most of them, the lack of standardization, we're gonna talk about later on about the World Small Animal Veterinary Association guidelines regarding the histopathology changes of the liver. So most of them, they didn't follow any standardization of what is, uh, in terms of what is a normal or, or abnormal uh, liver. Uh, when we talk about bias, we think about that most of the cases, they started with a uh, population, for example, uh, feline cholangitis, and then from that population, they look for concurrent diseases, 
for example, like inflammation of the intestines, pancreatitis. And this data cannot be applied to the real world because we already started from a biased population that cats, for example, with cholangitis. We cannot talk about that this is the overall prevalence of this disease. Of course, there are different studies, different ways to do that study. That means that we had different studies designed. So this is why we have to be so careful when we compare data between those studies. There are some studies that they look at cases that they suspected triaditis, and something that was quite common, and is quite common, that not all of them have triaditis. We're going to discuss, and I'm going to present the data from this uh, paper that we're going to mention several times during this presentation published in 2016, that overall, I think the idea we have to keep in mind that uh, that study, only 30% of the cats that the author suspected to have triaditis had really triaditis. On the other side, many cats have no uh, clinical signs. What, what does it mean? The same study, for example, they took healthy cats that underwent um, ovaristerectomy, and they took biopsies of the liver, pancreas, and, and intestines. And they found that 50% of these healthy cats had uh, histopathological changes in two or three organs. So some cats can have inflammation of those organs without having clinical signs. We're going to talk about later on and see what does it mean and how can we interpret and how can we apply this uh, uh, data in our clinic. We're going to start talking about inflammatory liver disease. Uh, again, uh, it's remember that we have to always follow what it is the World Small Animal Veterinary Association guidelines. And when we talk about cholangitis, it's a group of acquired I will say inflammatory disorders of the biliary tract, but when we have an involvement of the hepatic parenchyma, we're talking about cholangiopatitis. The scheme that was presented several years ago, uh, this is the, the, the book that was published uh, uh, around 2008, 2009. Nowadays, it's a free version uh, in the website that has been, because it has been updated. They talk about four types of cholangitis, the neutrophilic, the lymphocytic, the fluke infestation, and the destructive cholangitis. The last one has been reported in dogs, but not in cats. Also, it's important as a clinician that we think that uh, FAP, toxo, uh, can be a cause of cholangitis. We know that they are less common, but uh, that, are, that are important. So it's some, it's in, we have to keep in mind that. Yeah. Inflammatory liver disease, we talk about the neutrophilic form and the lymphocytic form. The neutrophilic form, it's the most commonly reported in the veterinary literature. Is uh, Usually, uh, we have a, a bacteria that we can isolate, and because we think, and there have been data that prove that this is an infection uh, happening in the, in the liver. Most of the time, we have some pancreatitis concurrently. And regarding the age, there's no data uh, that show us that maybe they're young or more adult. So there's not consistent data. There are cats that are presented from an acute, uh, uh, they are acute presentation in our clinic. And from this pathology point of view, it's true that they classify between acute and chronic. However, I think that it doesn't matter too much for us when we see these cats in acute or chronic because uh, from a clinical point of view, it's not going to change anything. So we like at the end to put everything together. And also it's important, this neutrophilic form, sometimes it's, uh, we have predisposing factor or comorbidities like cholelithiasis, crawly uh, ductal plate malformation, or any extrabiliary duct extraction. Those things happen with neutrophilic uh, inflammation of the liver. When we talk about lymphocytic cholangitis, we think that it's an immune disease. Uh, studies back in the 80s they, they, in the UK, they thought that maybe Persian cats were overrepresented. However, latest studies, they didn't, sh they didn't show the same uh, results. 
we think that maybe uh, even it's an immune mediated cause, we maybe have transient bacterial infection that triggers an autoimmune response, something that uh, we still not, we don't know for sure, but it's uh, something that we suspect. Regarding the age, again, uh, we, can, we have to say the same as the neutrophilic form. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, consistent data, but more and more we see that with more adult cats. It's more a progressive presentation rather than acute presentation. And we have to think always, as the main differential diagnosis of these cats is lymphoma. There are two interesting points I want to share with you. The first one is the fish, and the second one is Helicobacter SPP. Yeah. So about fish, it's first sense in situ hybridization. It's when we take a sample, uh, a biopsy sample, and we want, for example, look for a bacteria. We have, can apply this technique to uh, any, um, any uh, biopsy. So they did a study back in 2014 by uh, uh, several authors with Candy Simpson and others uh, with 39 cats with uh, inflammatory liver disease and 19 control cats as a control population. So they were looking for bacteria in those livers, and they found that uh, most of the liver, uh, inflammatory liver disease, they had some bacteria, but also three out of 19 control cats had some bacteria. But those cats were including cats with contamination, that we thought that there was a bacteria that was a contamination during the procedure of taking the biopsy, biopsy etc. But when we get the only enterohepatic bacteria, the ones that we take care, uh, uh, the inflammatory liver disease, it was 41% of the, of, the, uh, of the cats, and only for, uh, 6% was, um, was in the control group. I think the most important uh, key message of this, uh, of, this, um, of this study is that intrahepatic bacteria were located, or, sorry, were located mainly within the portal vessels and sinusoids. So that changed a little bit the idea, and what the author suggested, and I think it's really important, is that colonization likely occurs by the enteric translocation or by hematogenous means rather than the typical or just ascending infection of the bile duct. That means that there's something more uh, than just an ascending infection. What about Helicobacter? It can, uh, no, they've been found Helicobacter in the liver and bile of cats with uh, in inflammatory liver disease. However, they also, we found uh, Helicobacter in livers of cats with non-inflammatory uh, liver disease, like, for example, lymphoma, but also healthy cats. Therefore, we don't tend to look for that uh, disease. What about pancreatitis? We talk about uh, uh, liver. Now we move on about pancreatitis. What's going on there? Unfortunately, most of the causes, uh, most of the uh, cases, sorry, the cause is unknown. It can be acute and chronic. However, we keep, uh, unfortunately, having most of the cases with uh, calling them as idiopathic. That means that we don't know really why this is happening. There's been studies that showing that up to 60% of the cats as a post-mortem study having lesions, uh, inflammatory lesions in the pancreas. That raises two questions. Uh, maybe we have subclinical pancreatitis in healthy cats, or maybe we need to change what we think that it's abnormal in a pancreas and it may be normal. I mean that some degree of inflammation when they get old is normal and we cannot call them as true pancreatic, pancreatitis cats. How can we differentiate between acute and chronic? We're going to talk about later on, or later on when we talk about diagnosis. Uh, of course, that the best way is to do biopsy, but it's something that uh, we don't do on a regular basis, but it's the best way, or I would say it's the only way to differentiate. Some authors suggest that between acute and chronic is uh, the same disease but different time points. Because we know that acute can go to chronic. We know that some chronic disease can have flare-ups and have acute and chronic. So there's still a lot of questions that remains uh, unsolved. 
What about bacteria? We talk about bacteria in the liver. What about bacteria in the pancreas? Again, this was not really a, a publication. It was an abstract at the ACVAM 2011. And they found that bacterial colonization was more frequent in cats with moderate or severe pancreatitis, 13 out, out of 46, versus cats with only mild pancreatitis. They suspected also a translocation rather than just an ascending uh, uh, simple infection. Something to keep in mind, especially when we talk later on about uh, uh, why triditis is happening and also how do we treat those cats. I think more about pancreatitis. We know they have an acute form. It can be a necrotizing with higher mortality. It's the most common one. But also we can have the spurative form that is less frequent. We see that more in young cats. Overall, the mortality, of course, depends on the study, it, but it ranges from 9 to 41. Of course, there are many things that uh, can change these, uh, these numbers, many studies. And again, we have the same problem as uh, we talk later on about so many studies with so many bias, different metho methods, etc. And finally, remember, we have a chronic form. This is really important to understand because this is the most common. Remember that also diabetes and exocrine pancreatic insufficiency can be consequences of this chronic pancreatitis in cats. This is a list of the proposed causes of, a, of acute or chronic pancreatitis. And we see a long list from pancreatic ischemia, ductal obstruction, infectious agent, etc. In our presentation, we want to talk about concurrent biliary or GI tract disease. We talk about triaditis. But something that I want to point is that nowadays, something that we know is that also colloids, something that we didn't pay too much attention over the last years, can be a cause of pancreatitis. We can have colloids that are uh, occluding even partially the bile duct, causing some degree of pancreatitis. Um, and this is something that uh, has been shown recently in a paper published by a Journal of Small, uh, Journal of Small Animal uh, Veterinary Association um, by Sharon Center. Let's move on to the third uh, player. It's uh, um, what we say that the intestines, duodenum, jejunum, etc. We know that uh, these are really uh, a, a topic that there's a lot of debate. And we have to go back uh, in 2010 because there was a consensus statement by the ACVIM trying to uh, get an idea for the practitioners to know when we can apply this term to our cats. IBD. So they talk about that needs to be chronic uh, presentation. You need to prove that there's some histopathology evidence of um, inflammation. There, uh, that has not been in any response or really uh, a good response to any diet change, any, uh, any antibiotic treatment or anti therapy. That there are no other causes of inflammation happening in the GI tract and there is some response to anti-inflammatory or immunosuppressive uh, agents. This is the, 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 the consensus statement uh, in 2010. However, in humans, it's absolutely different. It's completely different. IBD in humans, we talk about Crohn's disease, or you have maybe ulcerative colitis. And it's completely different from dogs and cats. Why? Because the anatomical distribution is different. The inflammatory pattern is different. So it's something completely different when we talk about IBD in dogs, cats, or in humans. Therefore, nowadays, I think we are using an indiscriminate, uh, from an indiscriminate way, uh, this, this, this term, IBD. And that is causing a lot of confusion. Therefore, some authors, and more and more, they are more keen to talk about what we call feline, or canine, of course, chronic enteropathy. It's a broad term, but it gives you less confusion. So I would prefer just to talk about feline chronic enteropathy 
Why? Um, again, it's going to be easy for us. I, I, I'm sure that everyone is thinking now from home, like, okay, another acronym. We have so many acronyms that it's, things are getting a bit more confused. But I think that's going to help us. Uh, the definition, it's easy. It's more than three weeks of GI signs in the absence of any extra lumen uh, uh, or extra obstructive uh, causes of intestinal disease. Again, it's quite simple. We have inflammatory but also non-inflammatory disease. And what's in the box, just to make simple? Uh, food responsive enteropathy, immunosuppressive responsive enteropathy, Quite similar how we talk about IBD, but we prefer to give this name. But also small cell lymphoma can be in this box. Of course, others like non-responsive enteropathy. Unfortunately, there's no official scheme exists, so change, uh, things may change over next years. But we have to keep this in mind that I think it's a good way to go. So why I use uh, feline chronic enteropathy rather than IBD? I think because sometimes it can be difficult uh, or it's not possible to get some biopsy samples, so uh, we, can, we, have, we can suspect uh, inflammation, but we cannot document, we cannot prove that. Also, it does not interfere which treatment uh, I'm going to use. How many cats we have that we start with steroids and we diet, we remove the steroids, and the cat is, uh, is getting better? Are we talking about what we call before IBD or a full responsive enteropathy? I think that gives us less confusion. We talk about feline chronic enteropathy. And also because sometimes inflammation can be really small, can be minimal in these guys. And what we have is more structural damage rather than inflammation. Yeah. About feline chronic enteropathy, remember that it's a complex interaction between the microbiota, the genes, environmental factors, immune system. That has been really uh, uh, showed in, in humans. And I think that it's something important to keep in mind that when everything falls or everything doesn't work is when we have clinical signs. We mainly have lymphoplasmocytic enteritis, but also this can be seen in many cats with, uh, for example, hyperthyroidism, food hypersensitivity. So be careful when, we, uh, when you overinterpret inflammation in the guts. Be careful with lymphoma. We're going to talk about later on. Cats are not dogs. They can have feline chronic enteropathy from also they can have lymphoma in the GI tract and with weight loss and anorexia as the only signs. Of course, they can have vomiting and diarrhea, of course. But uh, cats sometimes are a little bit more difficult to know what's going on. And remember that the small intestine is where the bacteria reside, where they live. So this is why we when we're going to talk about um, the disease of triditis, we have to think about that uh, most of the bacteria that we see in the liver and the pancreas, they come from the intestine. So we have to take care of these intestines. Thanks, Jordi. I think that it has been a detailed explanation. So the next question, and it's uh, linked with the first part, it's why? liver, intestines, and pancreas are or tend to be affected together. There is any reason that explain that? Yeah, we have, uh, we have several uh, explanations, of course, that um, we have several hypotheses. Uh, again, the most accepted theory is that we have a common channel, and this is why we have cholangitis and pancreatitis together. If we remember that the anatomy in dogs uh, when we talk about the canine duodenum, we have the pancreatic duct and we have the bile duct that goes in this parallel, but they don't cross and they have uh, an entrance uh, in the canine duodenum separately. What's happening in cats? Cats are different. Cats have the bile duct and, bi uh, and pancreatic duct that joins together before going in the feline duodenum. Therefore, if we have an inflammation of this area, an infection, it's quite easy that the bacteria goes to the pancreas, to the bile duct. This, I will say, that it's the, uh, the most common accepted theory, also the oldest one. Uh, for example, we have a reflux duodenal content because we have a pressure, because we vomit. This can happen easier. But also, for example, if we have uh, an obstruction, we have an increase 
risk of liver uh, infection. For example, because we have a mechanical or a functional, it's not always uh, uh, something like a mechanical. It can be that the 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 opening it's not working properly, the papilla. Yeah, and also as we said, we have some cats with micro colliliths debris in the duodenal papilla that makes this papilla not work properly, causing an increased risk of liver infection as has been shown with cholangitis. We have new models nowadays that tells us a little bit more. Yeah, I would like to share these models that were published by uh, Kenny Simpson back in 2015 in a good review called Pancreatitis and Triditis in Cats, Causes and Treatment. The first one is that it tells you, okay, we have a dysbiosis in the, our uh, intestines. We have an inflammation of the mucosa, but also really important, we have a bacterial translocation. In this bacterial translocation goes to the liver, but also the pancreas, causing a suppurative pancreatitis, causing a neutrophilic cholangitis. It can be that also on the same in the same cat, we have some degree of reflux, as we were talking about. But again, opening the door to new ways to understand this disease and why this is happening. Yeah? And also, that's something that uh, we see that some cats, maybe septicemia, that means that we have some bacteria going on in the, in the body, can play a role. The second uh, option, the second theory that I think is quite interesting is that Maybe everything starts with an acute pancreatitis. We know the pancreatitis uh, can cause inf intestinal inflammation and reactive hepatitis because it's really close to those two organs. And from that point, everything goes wrong. We have neutrophilic cholangitis, we have an infection, and even inflammation, dysbiosis, translocation. We have a superative pancreatitis, and of course, again, uh, septicemia can play a role. And the last option, uh, everything starts with a suspected dysbiosis slash chronic inflammation of the small intestines, and we trigger an autoimmune disease. Again, it's quite complex uh, path path pathogenesis, but I think the main idea is that is the, is the suspected uh, etiology of uh, why some cats they have more uh, uh, autoimmune-mediated pancreatitis or immune-mediated uh, 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 cholangitis, like, for example, lymphocytic, where maybe bacteria doesn't play too much a role directly, but, of course, indirectly uh, in the intestines. Thanks. Uh, let's move now to the, to the prevalence. You uh, gave us some ideas in the first slides. But I don't know if you can give us more details about how common is feline triditis. Again, it is something that, um, as we said before, is something that it's really difficult to, uh, to answer this question because, as we said, there's so many studies, different ways to, to, to diagnose, etc. We talk about well, during the second slide. Uh, again, one study that I like always to mention, and it's something that I already mentioned that, and we're going to talk about later on, and we're going to talk about a lot because I think it's the biggest and the best study published so far. What they uh, did is just to look at cats that they suspected uh, triditis from a clinical point of view, and then they took some biopsies to see if they were right, wrong, and see the prevalence. And the question... Um, again, is, is one, two, or three organs, or even more organs are affected. So that paper uh, gave us the answer that in some cases we only have one organ affected if they have the clinical picture of, pain, of triditis, or two, uh, for example, feline chronic anthropathy plus cholangitis was around 22% of the cats. Feline chronic anthropathy plus pancreatitis was only 7% of the cats. It's important to understand that none of the cats had uh, cholangitis and pancreatitis without feline chronic enteropathy, and around 30% of the cats had triditis. And this number, 30%, is something that we see quite often in the studies. It's the same study that I told you before that 50% uh, of healthy cats, those cats that underwent over, 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 over,
they had inflammation in two organs. None of them had thyroiditis, but it's quite surprising, this high percentage in healthy cats. And remember that we think that it's not only three organs. Sometimes it can be a fourth, that it's the kidney. Uh, was studied already uh, a long time ago, in 2011, with feline cholangitis. They did a necropsy study, 44 cats. They found a prevalence of 32% of cats with thyroiditis. But again, as we said, this is a big bias because they start with cholangitis and they look how many cats had pancreatitis, how many cats had chronic enteropathy. But again, it gives you an idea of uh, the prevalence uh, with some limitations. And the most important thing that I want to mention from that study is that nephritis, inflammation of the kidney, was around 81% of the cats. So this is why one of the reasons sometimes we see that these cats have some also uh, renal issues. And just to make everything a little more complicated and to open, again, a new uh, door for debate, is that, for example, the first study that I'm mentioning from 2016, they found that the most common uh, form of cholangitis was the lymphocytic form. And about nephritis, the paper, sort of, uh, sorry, sorry, talking about cholangitis and nephritis, uh, they found that neutrophilic cholangitis was the most common uh, cause. We don't know why this happened. Of course, there are different populations, but we still have a lot of uh, questions without an answer. Okay, let's move now to, uh, to, to the issue how to diagnose this disease and which challenges we can find when we try to diagnose feline thyroiditis. Well, uh, as we've seen that, uh, we've been talking a little bit about that not all the cases are so easy and not everything that looks like thyroiditis is thyroiditis. Uh, this is why sometimes, again, the diagnosis is, is really challenging. But I think that the main problems is there are three, in my opinion. First, uh, an inflammation of those three organs, they have similar clinical signs. Second, if you want to prove and say your cat has pancreatitis, for sure you need pathology and it's something that we don't have uh, all the times. And problem number three, that also this is a big issue when we treat them. Which organ do we think that is the most uh, responsible or the guilty one for the clinical signs? Is the pancreas, is the pancreas and liver, is everything together? And sometimes this is difficult because for the treatment, but also for the diagnosis. We know that thyroiditis cats are older. We know that uh, it's really rare to have pancreatitis and cholangitis without feline uh, chronic enteropathy. And we know that feline chronic enteropathy is more severe if it is associated with cholangitis or pancreatitis. And finally, something I just want to uh, 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 just to let you remember that neutrophilic cholangitis and lymphocytic cholangitis may be associated both with an inflammation of the small intestine. It's not only neutrophilic or, or, or lymphocytic. Both forms can be associated with uh, an inflammation of the intestines. I think that the most important thing that also we, ha we can take uh, uh, from this, uh, these results that they, they are from that study from 2016 is that and we agree, everyone, that the feline chronic enteropathy plays an important role, or I will say maybe the most important one. Okay, and then uh, related with that, uh, with the last point you mentioned in this slide, uh, how can we differentiate uh, between neutrophilic and lymphocytic cholangitis? So if you can give us some points to, to, yes, to achieve this. Yeah, yeah, I think because I think it's, it's sometimes it's, uh, especially not, I'm, I'm not talking about, for example, cats with thyroiditis. Some cats, they come with only cholangitis. And sometimes it's difficult to know is this a neutrophilic or lymphocytic cholangitis because those diseases have different treatments. So it's something important to keep in mind and to know the differences. The neutrophilic form usually is more can mark elevation of neutrophils, ALT, and bilirubin. The, most of them, they're jaundice, they feel really bad. Uh, in 80% per of the cases, we grow some bacteria, like E. coli, less frequently enterococcus, but it's, it's important too. And in order to get the best 
uh, in terms of, of, uh, of bacteria, we try to collect from bile and tissue. And when we take a sample from the bile, we usually see neutrophils. When we talk about lymphocytic, for example, pyrexia, something that we see in the neutrophilic form, it's uncommon. Some cats, they don't come with an, uh, anorexia. The opposite, they come because they are really, really uh, angry, uh, hungry. Uh, they have polyphagia and ascites with a big belly. Uh, we don't see usually neutrophilia. We see maybe lymphocytosis, a hyperglobulinemia. The globulins are quite high in these cats. And if you stick a needle on the gallbladder, it's quite rare to see lymphocytes. From the ultrasound point of view, something that we, most of us, we have in our practice, unfortunately, we cannot differentiate those two forms. Of course, if we have a content within the gallbladder, liver that is hyperechoic, dilation of a common bile duct, we may think that this cat has cholangitis, but we cannot differentiate between those two forms. And finally, regarding ultrasound, it's important to keep in mind that it can be a normal liver, but you may have a severe cholangitis, cholangiopatitis. So how can I get a good sample of these cats? What we usually do is an ultrasound-guided percutaneous cholecystocentesis. Uh, everything is written just to, to, to show you how to do it. But again, uh, we, it's something I think it's important that when we take the sample, uh, we like to uh, empty the gallbladder. So the possibility of a leakage and a bile peritonitis decreases. And it's important to get the sample for cytology and, uh, and culture. Some authors suggested, and I think that it's, uh, I think it's right, that if you take samples from the liver, gallbladder, and if you take several samples from the liver, always get mm, uh, the most of it. That means that take a lot of samples and also send them to the, to the lab for culture. You have more, uh, it's more likely to you to have a positive if you send more uh, uh, samples to, to, the, to, you, to your lab, including, for example, uh, the crushed cholelites that sometimes they have bacteria inside. Yeah? Or, for example, especially when you take a bi uh, the gallbladder out or you take a sample of the gallbladder, take especially the, the, the part that is, we have more mucus rather than the bile that is more liquid. That's going to help you to get uh, a good results of the, of the biopsies. And of course, to know if uh, is any bacteria go, uh, playing a role, and of course, which bacteria and which antibiotic. And in most of the cases, please try to uh, avoid true cut. It has been associated with a lot of complications in our experience, and I think it's much better to perform a surgery and sometimes can be quicker and safer. Let's move on to the diagnosis of feline chronic enteropathy. And I think it's important to ask, uh, to ask us this question of how to get the best uh, GI biopsy. We know that it's not a really clear answer because we, there's a big debate between performing a surgery, performing an endoscopy. However, we have to think that uh, several years ago, they published some guidelines regarding what is the normal uh, biopsy of the gastro gastrointestinal tract of a cat or a dog. And that was published according to young cats who were less than two years old, uh, pathogen free. So, uh, what happened with this scheme that was published by the World Small Animal Veterinary Association? if it represents the real world, because we have to think that most of the cats that we see and we take a biopsy, they are not so young. They are more like 9, 10, 11 years old. So there was a study uh, published three years ago that tried to, s to solve this, this, this question and to see how is a normal cat uh, like that is more like uh, the cat that we are seeing in our practice with some GI signs. So they took 20 healthy cats with a median age of 9.5 years. All of them were healthy. What does it mean? They had CPLI, TLI, 
for a cobalamin normal. They had a good body condition score. So they took some biopsies of, the, of these cats. So what they found, and was really surprised for us, that in all of the cases, the pathologists, they saw some inflammation. And in two of those healthy cats, there was a diagnosis of lymphoma. When they did the PAR, they found eight positive. Five, they were unclear, and six polyclonal. So if we put everything together with immunostochemistry, biopsies, but also PAR, they diagnosed 13 cats with lymphoma. It's important to understand that they also they follow these cases. And when they followed that, those cases, they, sh they saw that only three cats developed uh, signs of chronic enteropathy, and only two died. And the, those that died, they were those that were diagnosed from a histopathology point of view uh, of lymphoma. And I think the take-home message of this study that has been really a, a big study for the conclusion, but also for the results, is that maybe the WSABA criteria regarding what is normal and what is abnormal uh, needs to be changed, especially when we talk about cats that are older than uh, two years old. Maybe we have some cats with subclinical disease, as we saw in pancreatitis, and we have to understand that this is a normal aging process, or maybe we are not able to see this uh, clinical science in our practice, but also it's something that is the PAR sometimes have low specificity. That means that if a PAR is positive, positive, it's not always a tumor cancer going on. We've seen that in leishmania, in leishmaniosis in dogs with PAR that are positive. So be careful with reading only PAR. What about diagnosis? Unfortunately, it's difficult to differentiate between chronic and acute form. We have a table about clinical signs uh, that's quite um, obvious for everyone. We see that on a regular basis. The clinical signs and the physical examination findings can be really broad and nonspecific in most of the patients. So what do we know about uh, uh, the diagnosis of feline uh, pancreatitis. We know that the gold standard is a biopsy, but uh, we don't have the, this biopsy most of the time. So most of the uh, cases, it's a presumptive uh, diagnosis. What about spec FPLI, the FPLI that we send to the lab, the one that we don't do uh, in, uh, in our practice, the one that we send to uh, an external laboratory. Uh, the most important thing is that we have a higher sensitivity in acute pancreatitis, so it's important that we know this limitation. And of course, we see lots of numbers with different percentages depending on which study are we reading. And one of the reasons is because each study has a different way to diagnose pancreatitis. Some uh, authors said that pancreatitis was according to a biopsy. Some authors said that uh, pancreatitis was when they had some clinical signs and some ultrasound findings. So this is why we have so many different numbers. If we assume, for example, that 10%, as many authors suggested, is normal of 10% of lymphocytic uh, infiltration in a pancreas, this changes completely the full picture because this increases the, sens the sensitivity and the specificity. And it's something that we think that it's normal in cats. What about the SNAP FPLI? There's not too much uh, uh, literature about that, but overall it works quite well. Uh, around only 10% of the cats, uh, they have uh, discordant results. And most of them, they have a false SNAP FPLI. So if you have a false SNAP, what, uh, and you, sus you still suspect uh, pancreatitis, then I think it's a good idea to uh, maybe run an SPEC FPLI. We don't do cytology on a regular basis, maybe mainly when they are acute and we suspect neoplasia or infection. 
What about biopsy? We mainly do biopsy also uh, in, in, an, in a chronic cases, and what we see, it's a fibrosis. We have a lymphocytic infiltration, and also we have multifocal distribution. And this is why uh, some cats with a spec FPLI or SNAP FPLI that have in a chronic form, the, uh, they have a false negative because they have a low uh, uh, lipase. And finally, when we perform a biopsy, we try to recommend to do the three regions of the pancreas. If you don't have time for taking those three regions or for any other reason, your, comf your surgeon is not comfortable and you have only to pick one, get the left limb because it's, you have more chances to get a diagnosis. Of course, be careful with hypotension and be gentle with the pancreas. What about ultrasound? We see many times that uh, they can have pancreatic enlargement, changes in the way that the, the echogenicity, uh, a mass effect. When you see this uh, hyperechoic pancreatic uh, appearance, or even free fluid. However, it's really important that not all changes are pancreatitis. For example, uh, when we have a nodular appearance of the pancreas or some increased diameter of the bile duct, or sorry, of the pancreatic duct, uh, this cannot be overinterpreted as pancreatitis. It can be changes uh, that are related to the age. What about sensitivity and specificity? It depends on the study, but again, uh, uh, it's around uh, 24 to 84 uh, of sensitivity and specificity, it's better than the sensitivity. That means that if you see a normal pancreas, please do not rule out a pancreatitis. What about key points regarding negative pronostic factor that has been shown in a recent paper? We know that hypoglycemia, ionized hypocalcemia, azotemia, or even pleurofusion and anorexia are negative pronostic factors. We, uh, the last study that I think uh, with 157 the cats, they showed a 22% of mortality. These are huge numbers and they are, uh, compared to humans, I think that it's, um, that it's quite high. But again, of course, depends on the studies. And in that study, what they found is that antibiotics were more frequently administered to survivors. And remember that we talked late before that uh, maybe uh, the bacteria is involved in some cases of more severe pancreatitis, and we're going to discuss later on about that in the treatment. Okay, thanks. Let's move to the treatment. Um, I don't know if you can share with us your experience about which is the best, treat the, the best treatment for this disease. Yes, again, I think it's uh, the treatment, again, is what we want to do at the end, so we are quite at the end. Uh, we, we try to do our best in, in terms of getting the best uh, diagnosis. Uh, it's important to understand why everything is happening, but at the end, what we want to do is to treat our patients. Yes, it is what uh, this is our main goal. So the general overview of the treatment, um, I think we have to think about the common scenario is that many times we don't have biopsies, or maybe we have sometimes some cytologies, but it's not quite common to have biopsies of the liver, pancreas, and intestines. And also, we have to think sometimes that maybe we have biopsy of the intestines, but we don't have other biopsies of the liver. And for example, think about the case of you took a sample of an, uh, intestines and you have an inflammation, so you think you have a chronic enteropathy. You want to treat with steroids. But on the other hand, you have a suspected neutrophilic cholangitis because the ALT is high, bilirubin is high, the cat is a bit jaundice, but you didn't take a, a, a sample of the gallbladder or you don't know if your cat uh, has an inflammatory pattern in the, in the liver. Are you going to treat these cats with steroids? Or maybe what it's the best way to go is to treat these cats before treating with steroids with some antibiotics because you suspect that this cat is going to have 
has some uh, chronic um, or uh, cholangitis. Because can you imagine what's going on in a cat with uh, acute or chronic cholangitis that is neutrophilic and is, has some bacteria and you give steroids? So it's something you have to avoid. So think about the picture even if you don't have the final uh, diagnosis. Yeah? So for example, start with some antibiotics and then a few days later you can start with steroids to treat the inflammatory uh, uh, lesion in the, uh, in the intestine. So be careful when uh, you treat those cats. You have to integrate all everything, clinical findings, lab findings, imaging, cytology, biopsy, culture. But remember, those cats, uh, usually don't, they don't feel really well, so they have to, you have to control the pain, you have to control the hypokalemia, vomiting, so those things are also important. What about the treatment of feline chronic enteropathy? Let's move on. So the treatment needs to be organized as, 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 the, as the diagnosis. Sometimes you see some in neutrophilic inflammation. Don't worry. Uh, most of the time it's a part of uh, the, chronic, the feline chronic enteropathy. Uh, it's a, a form of the inflammatory uh, disease. But in these cases, please look for uh, Campylobacter coli. Uh, because it can be a cause of neutrophilic uh, inflammation of this intestinal mucosa. The main differential diagnosis, we've seen that it's a uh, small cell lymphoma, but be careful with PAR because you can have false, uh, ne uh, false positive, and you may think that your cat has lymphoma when it's the opposite, it has just inflammation. The diet, I think, is extremely important. We see more and more cats that they are controlled only with diet, so think about that before moving to give storage or chloramucil to your cats. What about antibiotics? We know that may, they may work in dogs, but we don't have uh, these uh, results in cats. It's important the B12, cobalamin. Uh, uh, we love this vitamin. We always take care of this vitamin. We always look for this vitamin if it's low or if it's high. It's something to be worried, especially if this cat is really uh, low. And the supplementation can be done oral or parenteral. Usually, we use cyanocobalamin, but also, as in humans, you can use hydroxycobalamin. This is a study that showed that four doses of 300 micrograms per cat IM every two weeks uh, works well. But also, you can give oral. The problem is that you have to give every day. So sometimes, as a cat, it's not too easy. You can give prednisolone to mix per kick, or if you have side effects with the prednisolone, or you're not happy with the result of prednisolone, you can change to chlorambucil. Okay, uh, if, if we focus on pancreas, uh, my doubt or my question is that uh, once we have uh, been treating the pain, what else can we do uh, to improve the, the situation of these cats? Yeah, things that sometimes when we think about pancre pancreatitis, it's like, okay, it's only pain, and they can go home, and I think there are many things that we can do. Uh, the treatment of pancreatitis, of course, mainly it's symptomatic and supportive. There's not a pill that treats the, the pancreatitis. Unfortunately, we don't have this yet. Uh, we're going to give IV fluids, analgesia, things to stop them vomiting and feel sick, and, of course, enteral nutrition if it's needed. What about omeprazole, the proton pump inhibitor? The consensus statement from 2018, they found no evidence at all to give these cats pan uh, omeprazole with pancreatitis. And what something that we give is we give maropitan, that uh, it works really well in cats and dogs, and, but also we can give others, other antiemetics like ondansetron. And it works well as add-on medication. In healthy cats, we know that subcut is better than PROS or IV. And the question of how often it's three times a day. However, in cats with liver disease, we have to give it twice a day, not three times a day, because this drug is metabolized primarily by the liver. So we have to reduce the, uh, the times that we give this medication to these cats. 
What about antibiotics? We've already mentioned that before, and uh, the consensus statement of pancreatitis said that there was no evidence, and it's true. That we don't have a huge evidence that we treat these guys with antibiotics, but remember the, that we talk about that bacteria uh, was present more in cats with high uh, severity of pancreatitis, and there's a study that showed that cats we treated with antibiotics had higher survival times, so maybe they represent an option in severe cases. I'm not saying that now every cat with pancreatitis needs an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. However, what I'm saying is that in some severe cases that are not responsive to the treatment that we're giving, it may be an option. What we do in the chronic form that we don't have evidence of neutrophils, we don't have evidence of infection. We can give prednisolone or even has been shown in 2020 as an abstract at the AECVIM, uh, the use of cyclosporine in these cats. If we move to the cholangitis, uh, we usually start treatment with vitamin K. Uh, remember about the deficiency of vitamin K in these cats, so it's important to give them, especially we, we have to take biopsies, uh, cytology. While we're waiting for the results, especially with suspect for a neutrogil and neutrophilic cholangitis, we can start with some antibiotics. And those cats with a lymphocytic cholangitis and the culture is negative, we recommend to start with steroids. Prednisolone, two mix per kick, once a day, it's a good option. Again, if you don't have a good uh, outcome, we have some side effects that we are not happy with, the second option is corambucil, Two mix per cat, cat every other day uh, is what we use on a regular basis. Of course, you can give any antioxidant or UCDA, uh, but again, remember that you have to avoid the polypharmacy because sometimes it can be difficult to peel these cats. And it's something that also I want you to remember that uh, you have to be careful with what we call uh, cholangiovenous reflux that is when we have a dissemination, and it's a really acute dissemination of endotoxin and bacteria. And this can happen during the surgery, but also during the, um, during the hospitalization period. And this is really dangerous because you can have uh, severe complications. And finally, uh, last but not least, it's like if you have a cololith in the pancreatic duct or uh, common bile duct, you have to remove it. And what also it's important that you have to remove the gallbladder because it has been shown in a recent study that this is what's more common than what we thought. And you have to think where it comes from. Most likely it comes from the gallbladder. So the colloliths that we see in cats, they form most of them in the gallbladder. So if you remove the gallbladder in these cats, it's quite easy that in a few uh, weeks, months, or yes, you're going to have further colitis, and it can cause a big problem. And we can have lots of problems. Uh, sometimes we have partial or complete obstruction of the bile duct, as you can see here, for example, you have an stenotic common bile duct. You have the gallbladder. You have the common bile duct dilated. You have the didinum. And what's going on there? We have a stenotic common bile duct. Those cats, they may need, for example, gallbladder resection, stem placement, or in this case, what we did, of course, we were not able to place a stand here, so the surgeon, uh, what she did is a cholecystoduodenostomy. Yeah. So just to f finalize with and to end with my presentation, I would like to present you a case that hopefully we're going to put everything together and everything that we've learned over the last uh, minutes. We have Tim, it's a three years old, male neutered Siamese, seven days of vomiting, hyperexia, and weight loss. And the examination was abdominal pain, jaundice, and high temperature. We have the blood results with uh, some inflammation going on and some increased liver enzymes, ALT, ALP, GGT, bilirubin, were quite high. So what's next? 
What we do in these cases, I will highly recommend to do an ultrasound. And we saw a dilation of the bile ducts, heterogeneous liver. We saw an heterogeneous and thickened pancreas with pancreatic, peripancreatic hyperechronicity. And also, when we look at the intestine, we saw a really thickened wall, mainly the muscularis layer. Remember the blood test. Remember that we have a presentation of seven days of vomiting, hyperexia, and weight loss. So it's something that we cannot forget. We have highly, we are, we have a highly suspicion of triditis, but remember, we need a biopsy. We have other options, like lymphoma in the, in the GI tract. We may have a pancreatic carcinoma. So what we did is we offer the option to the owner, like we can do a percutaneous cholecystosynthesis, checking the B12 or uh, and N, adding a multimodal treatment. But option two, we asked them uh, if they wanted to do some biopsies. It's something really important, and I think that uh, one of the most important things in this talk is that option in one and two, uh, we have to think about nutrition. And a common mistake in these cases is no nutrition plan during the diagnostic uh, workup. And the diagnostic workup may last for several days. And this cat has been with several days of uh, anorexia. So the owner decided for option one. We diagnosed a neutrophilic inflammation doing apercutaneous cholecystosynthesis with a, a low vitamin B12. We gave a, a full treatment uh, with amoxicillin clavulamic, B12, injections, maropitan, mirtazapine, buprenorphine for the pain. We placed a juvagil tube. Uh, the plan was to start a hyperogenic diet in this case, but we thought that wait a little bit because we don't want to start this diet when they are not hungry in the ICU, but this was our plan. And in this case, it worked. Uh, team uh, improved, but we didn't have any biopsy. Are we talking about triaditis? Uh, because I'm treating with um, antibiotics, maybe a neutrophilic cholangitis. We may give, uh, we, we, may, we were giving hyperallergenic diet, maybe we were treating uh, a chronic enteropathy that was responsive to diet, so we were reducing the inflammation given a hyperallergenic diet, and we were treating a suspected pancreatitis. But again, something sometimes things do not work as we like to, and sometimes we have to send it to surgery. So I will say that option one or option two, one or the other is the best and the other one is the, 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 the bad one. But again, it's something to understand that we have to work uh, according to what the owners want, but also on really organized way. As we said, the common mistake is no nutrition plan during the diagnostic workup. Nutrition is really important in these cats. We place a superficial tube. In, in my experience, is the best option. We have to think that we can give uh, pharmacological appetite stimulation, but this does not exclude uh, the enteral feeding options. We have to treat the pain, nausea, ileus, fever, whatever is going on in these cats. We need to address this first. So what we've done so far, we've done a good job because we placed a superficial tube. We uh, gave a treatment against fever, possible infection. We had a good control of the pain. We, had, uh, we stopped the nausea, and we gave some appetite stimulants. So we were quite happy because our midterm plan was to encourage the oral feeding, especially with this, in this case, with hyperogenic diet. But also, our idea was to remove the esophageal tube because that means that the cat was eaten by his own. So, Jordi, related with the, this, this case, uh, what can I offer if the patient is not eating then? Again, uh, when the, the, the patient is not eating, I think that we have several options nowadays. We have mirtazapine is the drug that we more commonly are using nowadays, and it helps the appetite uh, really well. Uh, in healthy cats, we know that 1.88 mix, or I would say two mix per cat, it's safe and effective. Uh, but we have to think that what we see, 
And what we have uh, uh, available is 50 milligram tablets of mirtazapine. And to, and to do an eighth of a tablet, as you can see uh, fr in this picture, it's quite difficult. Some people think give one quarter, but we know that if you give one quarter of a tablet, we will have more side effects like agitation, vomiting, vocalization, tremor. So we don't want that. So what do we know about mirtazapine in cats with liver disease? That we have to uh, give it less often because we know that we have a prolonged half-life in these cats. We have the, nowadays we have the mirtazapine transdermal ointment in cats, and the dose is the same. It's to mix per cat once a day, and it has less toxicity, but the same efficacy. So it's something that we use, use on a regular basis in our clinic. What happened with Tim that Yona reported some vocalizations and tremors at home, and uh, what happened is that uh, they were giving most likely an, uh, 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 a higher dose than uh, what we wanted to, to give. And this is why it's so important that uh, we moved from the tablet to the uh, transdermal uh, ointment. So I originally used this, this drug. We have to keep an eye on a patient because we know that it's safe with liver disease. Even we still need more studies to prove that. Uh, so do you have two options when you use this, this medication? You have uh, option A, you give the dose that, uh, that is uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the leaflet, or you, have a, uh, you give a lower dose and increase if you have no side effects. So far, I use more option A than B, and we've seen that these cats, they do pretty well. Okay, then let's move to the last question of this session. And it's a uh, DAP that it's coming uh, quite often from the beds. So how common is the exocrine pancreatic insufficiency in, in cats? So um, what we thought is that this doesn't happen to cats. And because people thought that this doesn't happen to cats, no one was checking FTLI. That you know that is the best way to diagnose uh, feline exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. Um, and it's something that is happening uh, and always been happening, but nowadays, because we are more prone to test this disease, we have more cats with, uh, with uh, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And guess that the, uh, the most common cause is a chronic pancreatitis. Yeah? So when we have chronic pancreatitis and your duck is, cat is having diarrhea and is doing, is not doing really well, is having anorexia, then again, uh, I think it's good to check the FTLI. Uh, overall, uh, the local valamini is around 77% of the cats. So this is important to check if they have a cobalamin low. And of course, if it's low, you have to give cobalamin to these cats. So the treatment overall, it's enzymes and vitamin B12 and a highly digestible diet uh, with uh, overall a good uh, to partial respond with most of the cases. Unfortunately, I will say one out of 10, they don't do really well, but in my experience, it's because they have concomitant diseases or they don't, they don't want to eat uh, the food with enzymes, uh, that will be uh, the, the common uh, scenario of having a poor control of, the, of this disease. So just to finish this presentation, I will say that uh, cases can be difficult because, uh, because uh, most of the time the pathophysiology is, is complicated. Uh, and we don't know why this is happening, and we talk about that. Most of the cats, uh, we don't have uh, uh, a liver or pancreatic biopsy, so we cannot confirm 100%. Sometimes empirical treatment is a good option. We are not doing a, a bad, uh, bad medicine. Uh, we have to think that it's not always three organs that are affected. We can have nephritis, for example, as we've seen in many studies. Do we need maybe another definition name? Maybe, but again, we still do a lot of things that uh, we have to answer first. And what about low-grade lymphoma? It's also triaditis, which is not an inflammation, but we have many cats with pancreatitis, small cell lymphoma, 
in the GI tract and cholangitis. Again, maybe sometimes uh, we think that, that we, need to, we need to change this term or open this triaditis term to more diseases. Um, and I think that the, my last sentence, I, I think that I like to apply to this disease is that we have accomplished a lot, but we still have a long way to go and to understand how to treat them, what's going on, and what is the best for our patients. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jordi. It has been really, really interesting. So we have been receiving some questions during the session. So I ask all the attendees to keep connected for uh, five minutes and we will come back uh, now. Thanks. We are back. So, well, we have been receiving different questions. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so we will answer one of them. But the other ones, you can send them uh, to the email you can see below in the description of, in, of, of the YouTube. So, well, the, the question I would like to ask you, Jordi, is that uh, related with lymphoma, could it uh, be cured with a treatment of chlorambucil and prednisolone, which is your experience? So yes, uh, the, when we have a small cell lymphoma, uh, we treat with chlorambucil. And in some cats, uh, we have, I would say most of the cats, we have a really good response. And they live for several years. And in some cats that we achieve a complete remission of the clinical signs, what we do is on a regular basis, we check these cats and we uh, give the treatment less often. For example, if we give it every two weeks at the beginning, then maybe we give three every three or four weeks. And even in some cats, we stop the treatment and we wait if the disease reappears. But again, most of the cats, they have to stick with the treatment for life. Okay, thanks. So thanks for being here with us today and thanks all, all people to be connected to this session. We will come back after summer. This is the last one before uh, holidays. And uh, well, I, I hope to see you soon. Thanks. <laughs>